Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. I am back today with another True Crime Tuesday video and oh my god, this case has just really got me absolutely mind blown. I've been researching this case now for the past few days, probably actually over a week, and I just keep finding more and more stuff and it is just insane. And it's the first video that I've done which is an unsolved one, so it just has so many open ends that could literally go anywhere and I think that's why it's so difficult and you can research it and research it for forever because there's just there isn't a conclusion to it and it, it's really frustrating but it's so interesting at the same time so the video that I'm doing today is the disappearance of Maura Murray I'm sure you've all heard of it but there's a few interesting developments that happened last year so I'm sure that this video might have a few more bits that weren't in other people's videos that maybe did them a couple of years ago. So definitely stick around if you want the more up-to-date version of things. And if you haven't already, definitely subscribe to my channel. I'm still super new on YouTube, but every time I get a new subscriber, it literally makes my day. So if you did that, that would just be absolutely wonderful. And I'm just gonna get right into the case. So Maura Murray quite literally disappeared without a trace after crashing her car on the 9th of February in 2004. So now I'm going to go back and explain a little bit of the backstory of her life and what happened before this event. Maura was born on the 4th of May 1982 in Brockton, Massachusetts. Her parents are called Fred and Laurie and she had three older siblings, Fred, Kathleen and Julie and she had one younger brother called Kurt and when Maura was about six her parents got divorced and Maura spent the majority of her childhood living with her mother but she had a good relationship with both parents. Maura was absolutely an overachiever throughout her childhood and her early teens. She was gifted academically and athletically and she participated in a lot of sports including basketball. She was actually involved in competitive basketball and she was involved in tournaments and things which took her all around New England when she was still a teenager. Her main like thing that she was just super talented at was running. She was an amazing runner and she used to compete all the time when she was in high school. In 1998, she actually finished 33rd in the country in the US National Scholastic Outdoor Championships, which is pretty impressive for a teenager. Maura was also well known and well liked in her community too. She was very active within the community of her town and everybody described her as being really kind hearted having her signature dimples and a beautiful smile. She then went on to graduate top of her class from Whitman Hanson Regional High School, as well as being like a star athlete on the track team for that school too. After this, Maura accepted a congressional nomination from late Senator Edward Kennedy at the prestigious United States Military Academy in West Point, New York. She studied chemical engineering there for three semesters and then after her freshman year, she actually transferred transferred to the University of Massachusetts Amherst or otherwise known as UMass and she studied nursing there. Now she wasn't exactly expelled from West Point but she was on the verge of being kicked out because she'd done a couple of things that were strictly against their policy including stealing so I think it was a case of jumping before she got pushed so that is why she chose to go to UMass instead. This wasn't the only time that Maura had actually gotten into some trouble. In 2003, she got in trouble with the police for using a stolen credit card. And the police managed to track down this woman's stolen credit card from purchases that were made by somebody else in like restaurants and shops buying a load of food and they managed to track this person down to Maura. When she was questioned about it, she did admit that she had seen the credit card number on the bottom of an old receipt. So she noted it down and she was using it to purchase things for herself. But due to good behavior, the charge was sort of dismissed and it never sort of turned into anything too serious. Trouble did tend to follow Maura around a little bit, but the majority of people that knew her said that she was a good person. She just maybe made some poor decisions. Now this case happened sort of before social media really took off. So finding things out is super difficult and figuring out the timeline of things is very hard to do just because 
when something happens nowadays, everything is plastered all over social media and you can pretty much find out anything you need to know. But back then, it just wasn't like that. So information is a little bit more few and far between and things don't come out for a little while. So you're a bit unsure about certain things for like a couple of years, which is just insane when there's a missing person involved. So that is why some of the information is a little bit rocky about when it exactly happened so just keep that in mind on the night of the 5th of february so a few days before the disappearance maura was working her security job she had like a nighttime security job on the campus and during this evening shift she got a phone call from her sister kathleen who was struggling a little bit and it wasn't until a couple of years after this after her disappearance that we actually found out what they spoke about on the phone so Kathleen said that she called Maura because she'd just been released from rehab that night and she was having some trouble with her fiance already because Kathleen was a recovering alcoholic and apparently on the way home from the rehabilitation centre, her fiance had taken her to a liquor store, which is just obviously not what you want. That's not good for a recovering alcoholic. So Kathleen rang Maura, presumably upset about the situation and wanted to just rant about it. Apparently she was really upset about it. Her supervisor actually came into the little security office that she was in a couple of hours, I think, after this phone call. And they said that Maura was just like completely zoned out. Like she just wasn't focused. She was just not with it. And she had been crying. And so her supervisor took her back to her dorm room just to make sure she got back there safely. And she sort of said, what, what's the matter? Is everything okay? And all Maura said was my sister. So we don't really know what else happened there. But interestingly, at the same sort of time as this phone call or sort of around that time, there was actually a hit and run really close to the security office on the actual UMass campus and somebody had hit another student called Patrice Vassi and apparently it really sort of knocked him out a little bit. He couldn't remember big chunks of information. He had no idea what had happened to him. But a lot of people speculated that the reason that Maura was so completely upset and just not with it and just acting as though something major was wrong with her, people started to think that maybe she had been driving and she had hit Patrice which is why she was so upset because obviously if you just hit somebody and panicked and ran off, you would be distraught. But apparently the timelines don't work out. I've seen a lot of people say that this isn't true. It can't have been true due to when it happened and how she would have had to have got back to the office. It just wouldn't have made sense. So I know that a lot of people do believe that, but I don't think that that is what happened. I just, my gut feeling is telling me that that's not Maura that was involved in that. On Saturday the 7th of February 2004, so now two days before Maura's disappearance, Maura's father Fred went to go and visit her on campus because they were going to go and look for a new car. Maura's car was really old and although her friends say that she never really talked about getting a new car, that is what Fred and Maura were going to be doing that day. So Fred explained that he got to the campus at around 12pm and they went to Hadley and Northampton to look for new cars. And then after this, they went and picked up one of Maura's friends and they went out to dinner. And then after the dinner, they drove past a liquor store and they went in to get a few different bits and bobs. I'm not sure what they got to drink, but they got some bits. And then they drove past Fred's motel that he was staying at for the night. They dropped him off and then they took his car, which was a brand new Toyota Corolla, and they drove to a party, which was back on the UMass campus. It's debatable whether or not that was a good idea. I don't myself know why Fred would do that. They'd just been to a liquor store, they were going to a party. You would never give your daughter keys to a car when you know that there's going to be drinking involved. It seems really irresponsible, but that is besides the point that is what happened they drove back to the campus Maura and her friend they went to this party for a couple of hours and Maura had agreed with her dad that she was going to take the car back the next morning because he wasn't going to be using it he was just going to be going to bed but after being at the party for a couple of hours and reportedly drinking now there is no proof of this but apparently she was drinking while she was at the party she then just 
decided that she was going to take the car back to the motel that night, even though Fred didn't think that that was what was going to be happening and he didn't need it. But she was adamant that that was the plan. So she got into the car and she drove towards the motel. But when she was on her way there, she actually spun off the road and crashed into a guardrail. The crash caused thousands of pa <laughs> pounds. Oh, it's in America. The crash caused thousands of dollars worth of damage to Fred's new car after she went round a corner and then skidded off the road into the rail. And it's interesting because apparently she said when the police arrived on the scene that she hadn't drank in a while, almost making it seem like, oh, I've not drank that much, but I've not drank in a while, so it's affected me a bit more. Something along those lines. So after she said she'd not drank in a while, there was still no breathalyzer test or anything done to look into the fact that she was drinking. There was just nothing, nothing done. She was just driven back to Fred's motel in the police car because obviously the car was absolutely wrecked and she didn't get a ticket or anything. So that's interesting. So she got dropped off at the motel and went into Fred's hotel room. He apparently didn't realize that she was there until the next morning, even though she came into the room, she actually used Fred's phone to ring her boyfriend, Bill, to tell him about what happened and he sort of consoled her and said it'll be okay. But a lot of people are a bit confused about the fact that Fred didn't realize she was in there. It's a bit shifty, but that's that's what happened. So the next morning, Fred had to hire a new car to get him back to his house and he dropped Maura back at UMass on the way and he told her that she needed to go and pick up some like proper accident form things from some office so that they could fill them in and just get all the paperwork sorted like for insurance and things. Because luckily his car was gonna be covered by his insurance but the forms needed to be sorted. So she agreed that she would do that either that day or the following day. So Maura did have a boyfriend, he was called Bill and there's rumors that she was also actually having an affair with a guy named Hussein Baghdadi. And he, I believe, was a track coach. Obviously she was into running a lot, whether she still did at that time and he was a teacher, I'm not 100% sure, but he was a track teacher. And he would often say things about Maura mentioning like, oh, I would just love to run away or I'd just like to like start over. Just sort of little things like that. He said that she used to mention things like that all the time. And he also mentioned that Bill would occasionally be a bit physical, sort of alluding to the fact that she was in an abusive relationship with Bill. Now it's also rumored that Bill was having an affair, but again, this is all before social media. I feel like social media detectives would be able to figure out what was going on if it happened now, but because it was so long ago, it's difficult to know what was actually happening. So whether these bits are true, I'm not 100% sure, but I feel like it's crucial enough to put them in. On Monday the 9th of February, 2004, about a day and a half after being dropped off back at UMass by her dad in the hire vehicle, Maura wrote an email to her boyfriend saying, I got all of your messages, but I just wasn't ready to talk. And then she signed off the email saying, love you stud. And then she also submitted some nursing homework electronically and also sent an email to professors to tell them that she wouldn't be at campus for the rest of that week because there had been a death in her family. However, there actually was no death in the family. Maura's family have confirmed that this didn't happen. Nobody had died during that week. She then packed a bag with toiletries, makeup, workout clothes, some school books, and a few days worth of normal clothes as well. At around 3.15 p.m. Maura stopped off campus at an ATM and withdrew about $280 from the account. That was pretty much all that was in the account. She withdrew nearly the whole thing. And that was actually the last sort of CCTV image that was seen of Maura was at this ATM. She then stopped at a liquor store and got about $40 worth of alcohol and got back in her car and set off on a journey. It's reported that she left the Amherst Hadley area at about 4.30 p.m. and she drove her 1996 Saturn 
north towards New Hampshire, but nobody knows why she was going that way or what she was doing because she didn't tell anybody. Nobody had a clue that that is what she was doing. At about 7.25 p.m., Maura crashed her car on Route 112. Then, a couple of minutes later, at about 7.27 p.m., a resident in the Haverhill area named Faith Westman rang the police because she had been working in her office in her house and she heard the crash happen. So she called the police straight away and she was looking out of her window because she could see the car from her window. So while Faith was on the phone to the police, the call only lasted about one minute and 18 seconds, I think. But while she was doing this, a bus driver called Butch Atwood showed up at the scene. He drove past and saw the accident and saw Maura and he got out of his school bus and he spoke to Maura and asked her if she was okay, if she needed him to do anything, if she needed him to call the police. And she said, no, no, I'm fine. I've actually already called AAA. Some people report that she kind of pleaded with him like not to call the police. Obviously she'd only had a crash literally a day and a half before so it would be understandable that she would not want the police involved. We don't know if that's actually what she said but we do know that she said she didn't need him to ring the police. She'd called AAA already but Butch knew that that was impossible because it was right by the White Mountains. In that area there was just not a lot of service so he knew that she wouldn't have been able to ring anybody from her mobile so he actually drove his school bus back to his house which was only down the road and he parked up his bus and went inside to ring the police. This call took place at about 7.42 p.m. and he told the police what happened and he said that she seemed a little bit shaken up and the airbags had deployed in the car but he didn't see any blood or anything like that. So according to Faith, she saw Butch arrive and said that he stayed around the vehicle for about one to two minutes. But some people say that it was actually closer to three to four minutes. And I know that it seems ridiculous to point out such like minuscule bits of time, like minutes at a time, and you wouldn't normally think about that. But when it's a missing persons case and something like this, that can make a lot of difference. That could have meant that she actually ended up having between 10 to 11 minutes to disappear rather than the seven to nine minutes that authorities thought that it was likely she had. Faith also said that she saw what she presumed to be Maura around the trunk of the car, like a bit of activity going on around there, like maybe she was getting some things out. She also said that she thought she saw someone in the passenger seat smoking a cigarette, but then she recanted that and said that she didn't know that that could have just been Maura. It got a little bit murky with what happened, which is a bit frustrating because obviously these were the last moments that anybody saw her but there's not a lot we can do about that now. The first responding officer Cecil Smith arrived at the scene at about 7 46 p.m and Maura was gone but something I do want to mention is that people dispute that Cecil Smith actually did arrive at 7 46 p.m. It's rumoured that the time was logged incorrectly which would again mean that there are vital minutes that things could have happened that we don't know about. So if you'd actually got there a bit earlier or a bit later, that can mean a lot in something like this. So whether it was 7.46 or whether it was slightly different, we will never know, but that is what was put on the official report. So that's what we have to work with. So Cecil had a look around the car. He first noticed that it was locked. He saw a box of wine on the back seat, sort of on the floor, just behind the driver's seat. And he also saw a Coke bottle, like an empty Coke bottle that had like a reddish liquid in it that apparently smelt really strongly of alcohol. And there were also stains of a similar color on the ceiling of the car and also on the door of the car. There was visible damage to the driver's side, the front end, the front passenger side, the rear passenger side and the rear driver's side and the windscreen was also cracked as well. He also noticed that there was a rag stuffed in the tailpipe which obviously was a little bit strange at first but Fred actually came out and said that if anybody wondered what that was he'd actually told Maura to put that there because the car it was an old car smoke just used to pour out of the exhaust pipe so it was like a trick apparently 
back then to just shove a rag into it, which I don't know if that's a good idea. I mean, where, where is, where are those fumes going? If they're not going out of the exhaust, it doesn't seem like a good idea, but apparently he told her to do that. And it would just mean that she wouldn't be pulled over to get a ticket because it wouldn't be smoking. But then where's the smoke going? I don't know. So the responding officer, Cecil, was reported as saying, evidence at the scene indicated the vehicle had been eastbound and had gone off the roadway, struck some trees, spun around and come to rest facing the wrong way in the eastbound lane. Butch was asked by the police just to help them have a look around the scene. Obviously they didn't know anybody was missing at this point besides the fact that he had spoken to Maura so he knew there was someone there and obviously Faith has said that Maura was there. So Butch went and he suggested that he would drive west towards the French pond area and just have a little look around on the roads. And then a state trooper arrived as well and he also went to look west of the crash site. Then firefighters and emergency medical services arrived at the scene and EMS were only there for a couple of minutes because obviously there was nobody there that needed treating so they left and the firefighters looked around the area a little bit just to see if there was anything a bit unusual and after they didn't really come across anything they headed back west towards the fire station. Now as far as anybody is aware nobody checked east of the scene. All of these people that were kind of around the area all went towards the west side so nobody checked east of the crash site after it happened which you would think that you would look in all directions to find the person who was there like five minutes ago but now has disappeared. You'd think you'd just do like a, a circular sweep of the area but apparently not. Maura was declared a missing person the next day. I think a lot of people are a bit confused about why she wasn't declared missing at the time. It, it seems weird because she was there one minute and then she'd gone but I think because she'd just been in an accident and she'd been in another accident People are kind of like, well, if she'd been drinking or something and maybe she just thought she would flee the scene so that authorities couldn't get her and she'd be in trouble. So she wasn't declared officially a missing person until the next day. And authorities went to her dorm room and found that the majority of it had been packed up and it was just in boxes and even like artwork and posters and things had been taken down off the walls. They found a printout of map quest directions that were leading to a condo in Burlington, Vermont. And they also found like a typed letter that was addressed to her boyfriend talking about their relationship problems and things that were going on with them. And she just left that on top of one of the boxes. So it was kind of just like right there in front of you. Her phone records show that she placed a call to the person who owned the condos. And she also, I think, apparently placed a call to a fellow nursing student, but we don't know much about that at all. She also, I think, called her boyfriend, but I don't think she got through to him. And she also rang like a recorded information line thing that gave details about hotels and things also in Vermont. And the last thing that her phone picked up was her ringing her own voicemail because you used to have to do that back in the day. It, you used to have to dial your phone and ring your own voicemail, which is weird now, but that is the last thing that Maura did on her phone. There were a number of Maura's personal items still in the car, including gloves, CDs, makeup, her favourite stuffed animal, and a book called Not Without Peril, which is about people's misadventures in the White Mountains. But her debit card, credit cards, and phone were never found. They weren't in the car and they have never been located even to this day. The next day, be on the lookout posters were put up all in the area and they described Maura as wearing a dark coat, jeans and a black backpack. So the day after this, the majority of Maura's family had arrived in the area and they, along with the help of others, went and did some searches obviously in the area and two cadaver dogs actually tracked Maura's scent off her gloves to about 100 yards away from the crash site, but then they just lost the scent. So that kind of seemed as though it was gonna be a bit hopeful and then it just 
fizzled out into nothing. Maura's boyfriend and his parents then arrive into town and he is questioned, obviously, because they kind of question everybody that's linked to the person. And he said that when he was on his flight over from wherever he was to the New Hampshire area, he obviously had his phone turned off and when he turned it back on, he had a voicemail from an unknown to him number. And he said that it sounded like Maura sobbing into the phone. And when police and authorities looked into it, this call was traced to a calling card issued by the American Red Cross. And not a lot else is known about this call. It was never confirmed to be Maura but Bill is still adamant that it is. He is very vocal and actually speaks to people and answers questions a lot on Reddit. There's a subreddit dedicated to Maura's disappearance where people discuss theories and things they could do to sort of help the case and help find Maura. And he always responds back to people. People are always asking questions and he's very active on there. And he still thinks that it was Maura that made that voicemail. On the 12th of February, police reported that Maura might be heading towards the Cancamagus, Cancamagus Highway and that she was listed as endangered and possibly suicidal. The police also said, I think quite a lot around the time, that they believed that Maura was intoxicated at the time of the accident, but Butch said that he didn't think that Maura seemed impaired at all. And then I'm pretty sure that the police kind of went away from this theory, so then they didn't think that she was. It's a little bit iffy again, but there was alcohol in the car, so it's difficult to know whether she was or she wasn't. At the end of 2004, a guy gave Fred, Maura's father, a rusty stained knife, and he said it belonged to his brother, and his brother apparently had a criminal past, and he only lived about a mile away from where Maura crashed her car, and just after the disappearance, apparently, this brother and his girlfriend were acting really suspiciously and really weird, but they were investigated and things were looked into, but nothing came of this. In 2006, a search was done using cadaver dogs and apparently it took them to a house and the dogs went bonkers in a closet in this house, which was potentially these dogs finding human remains, but Again, this was looked into and nothing came of this either. Eight years after Maura's disappearance, I think the day before the date of her disappearance, so I think on the 8th of February, a YouTube channel popped up with the name 112 Dirtbag and it uploaded a video and it was just a man stood in a dark room laughing manically, really creepy, Ugh, really horrible. And at the end of the video, the words happy anniversary come up, which is just sick. And it's since been deleted, but you can still find it online. I'll try and include a clip of it here. And what links this to Maura's disappearance is the name. Obviously it had 112 in it and Maura went missing on route 112. And the dirtbag part refers to the fact that her dad actually gave an interview at one point on TV and said that Maura was potentially abducted by a bunch of dirtbags. So that kind of links it together. But this was looked into, obviously people started freaking out and reporting this and it was proven to just be a hoax by a very sick individual. 15 years later, so 2019, just last year, Fred announced that there was a potential new lead in the case when two cadaver dogs indicated to something in a basement really close to where Moro disappeared. And he had been granted access to this house because for a long time, for the past 15 years, the homeowners wouldn't even answer the door to Fred. They just refused, but eventually they relented. So investigators went in again with dogs and they had a look around, but they didn't find anything that linked to Maura and they didn't obviously find Maura herself. They even cut up bits of concrete and used ground penetrating radar to like thoroughly investigate the ground and there wasn't any bodies buried there or anything suspicious at all. 
Today, a team of investigators from the New Hampshire State Police and the FBI searched a home in Woodsville, New Hampshire. They were looking for evidence connected to the missing persons case of Laura Murray. I can tell you that no evidence was found in connection with that case. This one hurts because I thought we finally had it. This one is worse than the other false alarms or dead ends and I was pretty sure, you know. Okay, so on to the theories. There are so many theories that I found online. I'm going to try and include quite a few of them, the ones that I think are a little bit credible because there are just so many different variables that could have happened. So let's start with the first one. The first one being that she chose to end her own life and she was driving out to the White Mountains with that intention. She was going through quite a lot. She had left that note that she had written about her problems with her boyfriend and her sister was struggling and she had been visibly upset about that a couple of days before the disappearance and she was maybe still shaken up from the accident that she'd had literally 48 hours before she disappeared but her family just don't think that she would have done this they don't think that she would have chosen to end her own life so I'm not sure if that is the option that I think is likely to have happened. The next theory is that Maura was maybe abducted by an opportunistic killer, but there would have only been a couple of minutes where a potential abductor could have arrived at the scene after Butch left and before the police arrived. There wasn't a lot of time there. So some people think that maybe a car pulled up offering her some help and they used that time to grab her and pull her into their vehicle and then just drive off. Again, I'm not 100% sure. Her dad has vocalised that he thinks that this could be what happened, like she was in the wrong place at the wrong time kind of thing. Although people have been sort of named a person of interest over the years, Nobody has ever been charged or thoroughly investigated enough to say that they were a proper suspect. I've also seen a theory that Maura just chose to disappear. So she just wanted to start a new life. She just wanted to get away and start again. And she would have probably had help from others. So this is where the tandem theory comes in. So she was maybe driving along like in convoy. So like a car and then another car and then another car. And they were all driving together and Maura maybe span off the road and crashed and then maybe when Butch arrived she was just waiting for one of the other vehicles to spin around and come back and pick her up so that's why she was like no no I don't need any help like I'm fine I'm all right maybe she was just waiting and then she would just get back in the car with one of the friends and then they would just continue on to wherever they were going most people seem to think it was Canada if she did choose to disappear but she's never been spotted there or anything, but I suppose you could kind of change up your appearance. Another theory is that she wandered off with the intention of sort of getting away from the scene so that she couldn't get in any more trouble with the authorities. She'd only just had the crash a day and a half beforehand, so getting into another crash wasn't really looking too good. So maybe she wandered off and then died from exposure. It was snowing that night. I think that's why she crashed because it was a big snowy snowy evening if she did wander off and kind of got lost and disorientated the snow would have just meant that it was a bit too much and she could have ended up passing away there there was never a body found so how far would she have got before anything bad happened and the fact that nobody found her and they were using dogs and apart from the gloves that the dog found the scent for they never found any other scents so again it's really tricky to know if that could have happened, but that is a theory that quite a lot of people do think has potential. Another little bit more out of the box theory is that she was pregnant, like secretly pregnant with either Bill's baby or Hussein's baby. And she wanted to avoid her abusive relationship with Bill. So she decided to run away and raise her child elsewhere. Then she would avoid like custody battles and anything like that. But there was never any evidence to prove that she was pregnant. She'd never told anybody that she was pregnant. So I don't believe that theory. Some people think that Butch had something to do with it. Now, at first, when I was first researching this, I thought maybe Butch has got something to do with this because he was the last person to see Maura and speak to her. And 
it just, I don't know. I just kind of thought maybe he's got something going on here. And then as I was researching, I started to think, no, I don't think it's Butch. I'm just not sure about that. But then as I was researching a bit more, I found out something which made me think again, maybe it is Butch. So when he left Maura and he drove back to his house and went to call the police, instead of parking his bus where he would normally park his bus, he backed it up right next to an outbuilding that was on his property. And he never did that before. His neighbors all said that was a really weird thing to do because he has never parked his bus next to that outbuilding, like backed right up. He never did that. He always parked his bus on the front of his house, just outside. And his girlfriend who lived at the house also drove a school bus for a living and she parked right next to him on the driveway. And obviously there were school bus drivers. So the state provided floodlights on the front of the house somewhere to shine down onto the buses just to look after them, to make sure that no one could steal them because they're like public property, they're school buses. So he always would park it there because it was like a special parking space for these buses. So why would you choose to drive past that and then go into your property and then like back it up right next to a little outbuilding? That seems really suspicious to me. And a lot of people aren't fully sure what happened when he got there because there's a little bit of confusion as to whether it was him that spoke to the police or whether it was his girlfriend. I think what happened was he went in, he dialed the police and it was busy. So he hung up and went back out to wait in the bus for the police to come and speak to him and he left his girlfriend to ring. I think that's what happened, although some people say that it was physically him that spoke to the police. Another weird thing about the bus parking situation is I will insert a picture of where Butch's house is in comparison to where the crash site was and if he would have parked his bus on the front of the house where he would normally always park his bus, he would have been able to see Maura's car the whole time because it was literally just on a straight road like he would have been able to see it and have visuals on the car until the police arrived but because he chose to park in that weird place that he'd never parked before he couldn't see it so why would why would he do that I just find that really weird so yeah weird an investigative journalist named James Renner has been looking into this case for years He's written a book about it as well and he has been trying to figure out what happened and coming up with theories of what could have happened and he's claimed to have got loads of emails over the years from many people including people that are in Maura's inner circle. He also claimed to have got an email from an anonymous person named Ray Ramau which was spelled R-A-Y, so like Ray, like normal, and then R-U-M-M-A-U, which is an anagram for Maura Murray. And the subject line of the email said, stop looking. And the email contents just contained coordinates, which were to the north slope of Mount Carrigan, more specifically the Desolation Trail. And obviously James Renner was like, oh my God, I've got some coordinates. This seems like it could be something. So people went to check it out. They went to the coordinates and apparently the snow was just too heavy. They had to turn around and they couldn't actually check it out. But I've read online that people have since been to check it out because of course you would. If you got an email like that, you would think that is something really odd. People went to look at it and didn't find anything. But then I also saw that people went to it, but apparently it was the wrong coordinates that they went to or something, which I don't really understand, but nothing came from it anyway. So to be honest, I am not sure which theory I am leaning towards. It's so difficult. I kind of feel like I believe multiple different ones and I don't know how that's possible, but I don't know. The butch thing is weird. I don't think she just wandered off and died from exposure because somebody would have found her body. She just quite literally has disappeared without a trace and it's frustrating that we're probably never gonna find out what happened. 
I would like to believe that she just wanted a fresh start and she moved to Canada. I just think if she did do that, it's pretty cruel to not tell your family what you were doing because they have no idea what happened to her. I don't know. I've also seen another couple of theories. I haven't planned to talk about this, but I've just remembered. I've seen a couple of people say that they're a little bit suspicious about Fred, Maura's dad just because he acted a little bit weird, like putting that rag in the tailpipe is a bit weird. And some some people just think that the things that happened before her disappearance, like the crash that happened and the fact that they were buying her a new car and they'd not mentioned it to anyone, they kind of kept it a secret. And just a few different things. People were just like, Fred seems a little bit sus. Maybe he helped her to disappear. If you know of any information that I haven't included in this video, Obviously this video is going to be super long so I haven't included every single thing so definitely let me know in the comments. I would love to hear what you think or what you know. I would just like to have conversations like that with you guys and if you enjoyed this video definitely make sure to subscribe to my channel because I post videos like this every Tuesday. It's True Crime Tuesdays so definitely subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications so you know as soon as I post and smash the thumbs up button if you liked this video and you thought that the case was interesting. It's super interesting to me. So yeah, I will be back in a couple of days with my next video and back next Tuesday with another true crime case. So I will see you then. Bye.